guys, and welcome once again to a Country First Conversation. This is an exciting time for us as we continue our new series that inspires all of us to choose country over party. Now, following the insurrection at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th, Congressman Adam Kinzinger launched the movement Country First as a home for principled Americans who are tired of the poisonous extremism that has overtaken our beloved nation's politics. And if you haven't joined the movement, we invite you to do so by going to our website, countryfirst.com. That's with a one S-T in the URL, countryfirst.com. When you get there, you'll notice our most recent video that shows Adam talking about fear and its impact on our politics today. It is a very, very powerful video, and we have another one coming very, very soon. So look for that, or all you have to do is just like and subscribe on our social media pages so that you know when all of our videos and content are coming. My name is Matt Rodewald, and I will be hosting today's chat. Good to be with you. And joining us today are Representative Adam Kinzinger from Illinois, a six-term congressman whose district borders Wisconsin to the north, Indiana to the east, and from Durand to Donovan and every small Illinois town in between. Also with us today is Michael Steele, the former chair of the Republican National Committee and the first African-American elected to statewide office in Maryland. He also has a podcast, so make sure you check that out the Michael Steele podcast. Hello, everyone. Good to be with all of you. Michael, it's great to have you. How you been? What's going on? What's new? What's new in your world? Hey, dude, I'm just trying to keep up with you. What are you talking about? (laughs) (laughs) I'm doing great. No, it's great to be with you. It's good to have a conversation always. I hope you and the family are doing well and you know, they treat you all right on Capitol Hill, baby. No, you know, they're, they're trying. I just, I treat everybody right. So, you know, it just pays back, right? Hey, let me, uh, I want to get into a little bit on, you know, because right now everybody's revealing fundraising numbers. There's been a lot of talk of fundraising. But I want to just kind of, as we get started here, I want to just get your kind of top line thoughts on... Where the Republican Party is at, you know, and you can maybe touch a little on just kind of politics in general. But, you know, despite the fact that you look like you're 25 years old, you've been around, you know, a little politics and just want to kind of get your opening thoughts on it. Well, you know, it, it's, you know, the one thing about politics is it, it's always changing. And, you know, the aspiration of political folks like you and me um, is that it changes for the better. Mm-hmm. It's always looking to uh, get to a higher ground to include more people, uh, to have broader, bigger conversations about important things. Uh, that sets up the governing principles that certainly have defined generations of political leadership uh, going back to the founding of the country. Um, the, the challenge we face in these times, and it's not like we haven't been here before, Adam, but uh, this is different because the platforming, the networking, mm-hmm the communication apparatus itself is very different. So the challenge we have now is um, instead of doing the things that I've just described, we're contracting, we're becoming small-minded, we're narrowing our focus, we're becoming tribal, um, and and we're focused more on us as opposed to, you know, all of us. You know, it's just who's ever in my tribe, the rest of you uh, are not welcome. And, And so it's changing the way not only we talk about politics, but how we do public policy. You know that firsthand mm-hmm. um, from uh, your service in the House. And so it's when you look at where Republican, Republicans and Republicanism are, they actually, in my view, are splitting. Republicans are going in one direction, Republicanism, which is sort of the ideal of the founding of the party uh, that I think adhere to and i and i believe you do as well um is trying to trying to pull us in a different direction so they're they're competing interests right now man that are that are at odds with each other which is why i i took to heart so much uh your words a few months ago um coming on the heels of uh the awful events of january 6th that you know i'm you adam ready for this fight and i was like i tweeted out so am i (laughs) sign me up i you know because it's that important that we uh, pull our politics away from the abyss and back onto saner, stronger ground so we can get back to governing around, you know, those conservative ideas and principles that animated us in the first place to join the party. Yeah, and I think one of the, 
You know, one of the things that I've seen that's that's concerning is just this idea of, you know, oh, well, the we can do this because the other side does this and the other side goes, right. well, they do this. And it's just this kind of descent to the lowest common denominator. And it's interesting because if you listen to Democrats talk, they think that Republicans always, you know, run the table on them. If you're in a Republican meeting, they're like, well, the Dems <laughs> always run the table on us. And it's like... You know, so what happens is everybody kind of steps up their offense without thinking about the consequences. And uh, and like you said, we separate into tribes. It becomes, yeah, maybe what Donald Trump said wasn't true, but I got to pick a team and he's my yeah. team instead of like, OK, I can critically think through this stuff and have an opinion that may be independent from him on some things and with him on the others. It's 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 a concerning thing. And I think the only way to get out of it you know, is is to talk about it. I think people have to be aware of it because this has happened so slowly and insidiously that it's like, okay, that's where we're at now. How do we get out? Yeah, and and and, and you and what illustrates your point um, is what we learned this week uh, on the heels of uh, you know former Speaker John Boehner's book, in which you know he doesn't hold back mm. at all. I mean, he just like lays <laughs> it bare and talks about you know, Tea Party and Ted Cruz and Trump and all this. But then when asked, well, who did you vote for? He goes, Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> and you're sitting there going, and, and that's exactly the point you just made. You know, it's, you, you have this, this situation where at the end of the day, you fall back into your tribe. And, and the test is, can you, in your leadership, uh, stand your ground firmly enough to say, no, mm. that, my tribe is wrong on this, and I cannot stand with them. Yes, I, I get it. I understand all the, all the talking points. But at the end of the day, it is about the country. It is about the American people. It is about this fledgling republic that we have. Uh, and someone has to stand up for it. You just can't always give in because it's your guy um, on the mat. If your guy is cheating in the ring, you're going to get behind that. Mm. Um, I, I don't think that's the, the lessons that we want to pass on, but that's why it's important to talk about it. And this is why it's important to, you know, as you noted, you know, to be prepared to, to fight for those, those ideas. Yeah. And I think it's always interesting. You have like, you know, you'll see it on Twitter or comments where people say, oh, I'm ready. You know, in essence, I'm ready for the Civil War. I got all my guns. I'm ready to fight, right? <laughs> and, uh, and you know, these are obviously people that have never seen war. And it's like, look, you know, your anger about cancel culture, you know, or your anger right. about Coca-Cola or whatever it is of the day, whatever you woke up and got angry about, that will pale in comparison to if this whole thing fails. And all of a sudden, you know, tax rates won't matter if you can't get your heart medicine from CVS because, you know, That's the right. whole system is falling apart. And it really is that serious. I, I'll tell you a quick funny thing about Boehner, which I loved, is you, you never had to question where he was on anything. Nope. So we'd be in his office and say, you know, when we were the freshman class coming in, trying to, you know, run the table and and he just, we'd say, you know, Mr. Speaker, we want X, Y, and Z. And he'd just look at us, take a drag out of his cigarette and goes, yeah, that ain't happening. <laughs> it's just like, all right, okay, what do you say to that? You know, not even like, oh, you know, we'll look into it. We'll put a commitment. Like, nah, that ain't happening next. <laughs> it's an I old mean, school. It, I miss it. It. Was, it was that way for me, too. I, I, you know, I would have a political briefing with him uh, every week, and the same with Mitch McConnell and the Senate uh, and the Senate leadership. And every once in a while, like every month or so we'd have a joint meeting with uh boehner mcconnell and myself and i, I that that's the meeting you want to be at the fly on the wall for because you particularly john always wanted to have the meeting in his office and we all know why <laughs> he could smoke in his office he hated going to the senate because mcconnell wouldn't let him smoke so of course you get in his office and the place is like okay you know, fog central, right? <laughs> and, and and you sit down, and oh my god, it's so funny. You, you just brought back some great memories because he would, I would lay out. Okay, so here's the political landscape as as I'm traveling around the country. Here's what I'm seeing. A lot of folks. I think we can really do some good uh, branding. Have good conversations around this 
uh, Obamacare legislation, um, but, you know, we got to put something on the table to sort of, you know, show that we're in the game. And McConnell would sit there and just kind of wait, wait, beat, beat, and Bader would go, no, that ain't happening. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. And I remember sitting and in. Me, and he looked at me and go, he says, you know, my members are, no, that's not, I can't, I can't get them in that space right now. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, re- they're going into, they're going into Obamacare. That's where we're going. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you say? If you're a leader, if you're, you know, you think you're a leader and nobody's following you, you're just a guy out for a walk. And uh, I, man, I remember sitting in those conference meetings and, you know, as a freshman, I was sitting there and, you know, we're all excited because we're going to change the world. And all of a sudden I smell cigarette smoke and we're in the middle of the Capitol. Yep. It's Boehner sitting there. <laughs> Nobody else could. But Boehner could, so... That's it. You're listening to a Country First Conversation, and our guest today is Michael Steele, the former RNC chairman, and you see him on TV on MSNBC from time to time. Don't forget to check out his podcast when you get a chance to as well. And go to our website, countryfirst.com. That's with a one S-T in the URL, countryfirst.com. If you've missed our other conversations, we have them up online if you'd like to take a listen. And make sure you are following us on social media, on Facebook and Twitter as well. We could get into even more John Boehner conversations. One thing we will get into is whether Michael Steele is still a Republican. That is to come, but first, conversation about financing and how money and politics affects the current landscape. I want to talk a little about kind of money and politics and because, you know, right now it's it's all over the news. I I had a good I had a great reelect fundraising quarter and and we had a great fundraising quarter for Country First, which I want to thank everybody for because we didn't even set out to to raise money for the movement. That wasn't the point. It's not about me, but it's it's really came organically. And and so I think that's a good example of, you know, maybe some positive change with how this happened. There's a lot of examples of of, you know, a negative influence of money or negative fundraising. You look at Marjorie Taylor Greene raising three million dollars and doesn't even have committees. It's a it's a massive change. So I wanna I wanna kinda ask you a little bit about your your top line thoughts on you know, from fundraising when you were the party chair, what that looked like to kind of where we are now. And, you know, what are some of the things we need to be aware of? Because I think, again, like like everything, like where we are in politics, it happens so slowly that people don't really recognize the forest when they're looking at the trees. So what are your thoughts on where we're at and where we've been? Yeah, it, it was a very different situation for me when I came in as chairman. I, I, I came in with some real handicaps because we had just come off of two very ugly bruising election cycles in 2006 and 2008. We just lost our our bid for the presidency with uh, John McCain, God love him and rest him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so the party was trying to regroup. The Bush team had come out uh, of space and they were gone back to Texas. Um, Rove and the boys, and this was on the heels of Citizens United had just landed um, uh, on the country by the Supreme Court uh, that June of 2009, and uh, we were off to the races. And, um, you know, a lot of folks had um, uh, pushed this idea of, okay, recalibrating uh, fundraising, recalibrating uh, the revenue streams. And so I ran into the situation where a lot of the Bush donors followed Bush at the insistence of Karl Rove, who was setting up his super PAC, so he wanted those dollars to go to him and not the RNC. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember talking with one major donor who said, well, I just got a call from Carl, said don't give to the RNC. I went, <laughs> oh, okay, so that's what we're doing now. <laughs> how, how am I going to win an election if I'm not raising money, right? right. Uh, and I was staring right at Virginia and New Jersey with um, – you know, Bob McDonald in Virginia and Chris Christie in New Jersey running for governors in what were then uphill battles uh, with, you know, Obama sitting at 70 percent. The Democrats had control of the House um, and the Senate and and the world was very different for Republicans. So what I did, quite honestly, uh, when I realized that I had internal and external obstacles, I took a book, a a book out of the page of the Democratic Party. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I went to small dollar donors. The party had never raised money from small dollar uh, donors before, not in any appreciable manner, because a lot of the focus was on corporate and and major givers. Um, And so there was not a real emphasis. And they kind of left that to the purview of the state. 
Uh, yeah, so and it I takes time, a, you know, building that. It's not like you can yeah. say, I'm going to implement this and show the result a day later. It's like, that's a year, two, three year long process. Well, guess what we did? We, we got, we raised one, $192 million wow. in 18 months. Wow. Um, and we were able to do it because we, along with that, built the grassroots network. And, and that's the effectiveness that you now see with the Marjorie Taylor Greens and the Josh Hawleys and others. They no longer rely on the party to be their, their source of revenue. They don't mm-hmm. use that as the hook uh, to get people to give, nor do they go to the RNC or the NRSC or the NRCC uh, in, in the way and the same degree that they did in the past because they've each now developed their own network of small dollar donors who, as you just noted, um, with uh, Taylor Green, for example, who has no committee assi- assignments, is largely a pariah in the House, is raising more monies than, than incumbents uh, who have committee assignments uh, and are considered, you know, sort of the, the brand Republican conservative. Uh, and that's because she's been able to use her celebrity. And that's the other new piece in all of this is that you no longer have political leaders. You have political celebrities. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, the Hollies of the world, you know, flashing the, the peace sign to the insurrectionists translates that photo into a million dollars worth of cash. Mm-hmm. Marjorie Taylor Greene, who, you know, you know, gets all badass uh, with uh, an 18 year old, mm-hmm. uh, takes that video and sends it back out, talks about cancel culture and and and, you know, perpetuates, a, you know, a given narrative and raises a million dollars off of it. They don't need the party to do that. Mm-hmm. So the dynamics now are very different for how not just institutions like the RNC will raise money, or even institutions like a super PAC in the, in the old model would raise money. But now this new frontier where you go to an individual donor, you ask them, hey, can I put $6 a month on your credit card? They say yes. They forget about it. You multiply that 100,000 times, and you begin to see the math very quickly. Yeah, it's you know, it's, it's interesting because I just – Ever, so I've been in, you know, I'm starting my 11th year and I, I've seen a whole lot of people come out here and be, you know, famous in their first year and flame out. Nobody talks about them. And I, so I'm still wondering, you know, does that happen to Marjorie Taylor Greene and some of those others? But it's mm-hmm. just a whole different, and I think it's the same reason members of the House now can, you know, run for president because with so many news outlets, with, you know, Twitter, Facebook, all that kind of stuff, you can now become a national figure. And the problem is, you know, we recognized, I think, that fear does a good job in raising money because fear is like the most yep. compelling human emotion. So, yep. you know, if Nancy Pelosi is going to take away your health care or if Republicans are going to, you know, take food out of the mouths of children, that is compelling because you give 20 bucks to prevent that from happening. The problem is... It works for a few cycles, but it destroys democracies because oh my gosh, yeah. it just crumbles that trust we have that you have to have if you're going to be in a system where, you know, you debate, talk, shake hands, that kind of stuff. And so, you know, it's been interesting. So what I also believe that basically the party itself, whether it's a county party, a state party or the national party really almost has no role in leading anything anymore. It's more of a conduit for some funding for kind of a debate society. But in reality, it has no power like it used to. You know, it used to be able to compel people to vote a certain way or you could cut off funding. That's how why we were generally a centrist country is because both of those parties could kind of pull center left, center right. What's your thoughts on that and how right. that has evolved? Yeah, no, I think I think that analysis is spot on. Um, and, and the other thing that is, um, I think, important uh, to recognize is that a lot a lot of this, a lot of this is uh, driven by the emergence of activism in the process by everyday folks. The way our politics unfolded and, and why you go back, and even in very contentious times, and I, and I like to give this example, um, even in the midst of impeaching Bill Clinton, Republicans and Democrats were able to balance the nation's budget, give us welfare reform, put out a criminal justice uh, strategy, et cetera, et cetera. They were working and accomplishing, working on accomplishing big 
pieces of legislation, uh, even though the politics was roiling behind the scenes. And that was because the politicians never wanted it to be the, be the thing. Mm-hmm. Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan, despite their political differences, got along personally. Bill Clinton and Newt Gingrich, despite their political differences, were able to accomplish big legislative pieces. Although the, the truth of the matter is what you saw, and, and, and Gingrich had a real hand in this, was bringing into the House a lot of the the street conversation in politics. So the, you know, that classic moment where they would do those one minute speeches from the floor and, and then speaker of the house, right. Thought he was, you know, going to teach Newt and those renegade Republicans the lessons and turn Mm. the cameras around to show that they they were talking to no one actually excited the base Mm. and, and got them involved and committed them more to, um, uh, a different narrative. Mm-hmm. And so now you have a situation where the tail is wagging the dog. Um, and, and so you have all this stuff where people get jacked up with lack of information because, or accurate information because they're getting news from all kinds of sources. Uh, uh, as we're finding out more and more, a lot of it not very reliable. And when you throw in QAnon and all the conspiracy crazy, that ratchets up the level of, of noise even more so. Uh, and so that then begins to dictate the patterns. And I think it has an impact on how your colleagues govern uh, mm. and how they how they uh, put forth legislation. And, and what you're seeing is those big those big, bold strategies aren't being risked anymore. They're mm. not taking the risk of that because they don't want to pick off some small cabal of loud voices in the corner of the room who are spouting some maddening conspiracy because that, guess what, impacts that small dollar donation. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> it, it, it impacts all, and then it starts to go down from there. So, yeah, I think it's, it's a real, it's an, it, real problem for leaders uh, to commit themselves to the kind of public service that we have seen in the past because they're now being whipsawed uh, by two things. One, building up their own celebrity. Uh, and two, uh, a base that now feels more emboldened to dictate the terms of engagement. Yeah, and I started to see this when we got... It. Well, so my whole realization that this was going to be different, I, I got elected in 2010. Um, I, I would have considered myself then a Tea Party candidate because mm-hmm. I think the Tea Party in 10 and 12 were very different entities. Oh, I know, yeah. <laughs> but I remember... I you remember know, your race. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was a fun one. But I remember, you know, that, that intervening period between I'm elected and sworn in, you know, you go to these uh, uh, orientations and... And I remember I went flying one day with the military, landed, and my phone was just blowing up with messages and everything. And it was people saying, you can't go to the quote-unquote establishment orientation. You have to go to the Tea Party orientation. If you don't go to the Tea Party orientation, you're not a real Tea Partier. And and then you take that with, like, you know, Ted Cruz's kind of defund Obamacare push where, you know, now through whatever organization that's raising money off this, they can pressure your constituents to ask you if you're going to vote to defund Obamacare by shutting down the federal government. If you say no, because it's not really possible, they don't believe you because Ted Cruz, who knows everything, said this. And uh, and right. so it's easier just to acquiesce and be like, yeah, screw it. I'm going to vote to shut it down. I don't own it. I'm one of 100. I think another big problem is you know, these two-year increments of elections with all the money now, with all the attention on D.C., you literally start your election the day after you're sworn in. And and, and there's no time to correct course for a party like, you know, after January 6th. It's like, okay, we have two years. Can we really correct course? Do we need to just grab the Trump train so that we can win the majority and then we'll deal with it? Well, and and you you touch on a couple of very important uh, elements of your narrative inside the house, which um, uh, I think is very, very interesting and very important to understand and appreciate when, you know, when you have people saying to you, um, go to the Tea Party uh, orientation and not the establishment Mm -hmm. orientation, you know, what, what are we saying here? And what is the expectation here? And, and the reality of, now trying to, okay, I got to think about that. But then, as you noted, I've got to start raising because I'm back in cycle in 
six six weeks, eight weeks, nine weeks mm-hmm. um, to start my reelect because you know I only have this job for literally eighteen months. When you stop and think about it, um, and, and so the the internal pressures give you know allow you to sort of step back and and take the easy the easier route out. So as Ted Cruz and his ilk are out there screaming about defund Obamacare, don't support Obamacare. Guys like me are sitting there going, and this was, I had this battle with a couple of U.S. senators at the time when I got out in front on some policy issues because there was no policy otherwise. I had to tell people something, right? Mm-hmm. And, I was remi- and I was told, well, you don't, as national chairman, you don't get to do policy. And I looked at the senator and I said, well, you're not doing it, so <laughs> someone has to. Yeah. And my point to him was, you can't just tell people don't do X, yep. right? Listen, we don't support Obamacare. Okay, I'm down with that. I agree. So what's the alternative? Yep. Yep. You've, got, you've got to put something in front of people. You've got to be able to say, and Republicans used to do that. They used to say that's, that's where Obamacare came from, as a matter of fact. It was in response to Hillary Clinton's health care plan that Heritage and conservatives at that time created this this process this particular package that later would be put implemented by Mitt Romney in Massachusetts and later adopted and I would argue bastardized to some degree by Barack Obama but nonetheless the elements of the original plan are there so a acknowledge that and say well since you want to screw up the original idea here's a better way but we went to the we went to the sloganeering mm-hmm. and we went to the re- repeal in the place and here's the frustration People sat and waited. Okay, I'm a, I need some health care. So tell me what you're going to replace it with, because right. otherwise I'm going to stick with Obamacare. And so that's where, you know, you sit back and you, and you go, well, how did Obamacare suddenly become popular? Well, we never gave them an alternative. Mm-hmm. We mm-hmm. had 14 doctors in the House of Representatives that came in with you in, that early, in those early stretches of, of the Tea Party and they were summarily not allowed to put together a package. Everyone was like, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. So that's a big part of the, the, the problem is when you just want to scare people and say the other side is, is going to give you some type of socialism and run it down your throat and take away your liberties as we listened to, um, you know, uh, Jim Jordan yesterday in, in the, uh, DOJ hearings uh, hmm. ranting on about civil liberties. I'm like, well, dude, put your proposal on the your counter proposal on the table. Yeah. How do you? And it's a mask. That? And, and, and that's the problem. Right. Yeah. I think uh, it's, it's pretty amazing, you know, just that like, so I, I was thinking in the re- replace Obamacare, I was on the committee. We had, you know, a gajillion hour markup. And, but I remember it was Rand Paul. Everybody blames John McCain for taking, tanking the repeal. It was all Rand Paul. He's the one that came over to the house with all these cameras, said we were drawing this in secret. We weren't drawing it in secret. And then when we had a good bill, the Freedom Club made the decision that they wouldn't vote for it unless we allowed states to opt out of pre existing condition protection. That killed us in the election. It also killed the bill. We could have had this, what I think would have been a good bill. You're listening to a Country First Conversation, and our guest today is Michael Steele, the former RNC chairman, and you see him on television from time to time as an MSNBC political analyst. Oh, and he's got a podcast, so make sure you check out the Michael Steele podcast online. If you've missed any of our other conversations, we have them up, and make sure you get a chance to look at countryfirst.com. That's with a one S-T in the URL, countryfirst.com. If it's any easier, they are also over on our YouTube channel, So make sure that you go there and subscribe and sign up for notifications today. Public financing for campaigns. Is there a solution to the issue of big money in politics? Well, the two of them discuss that right now. Let me, uh, I want to just ask you to kind of what your thoughts are on how to how to fix kind of the issue of, you know, the fundraising, the money. I mean, obviously, you don't have all the answers. You'd probably be you know, selling that out there. But what's what's your thoughts on how to do that? And then I'll just have another question for you and then we can let you go. Yeah, sure. You know, I, I think, I, you know, I, I, I totally get uh, the Citizens United uh, legislation. In fact, I had 
uh, at the RNC, we had a companion uh, case before the uh, Supreme Court, which would actually uh, return, would have would repealed or taken down McCain-Feingold, which was the initial problem, uh, taking away the ability of the parties to raise the money. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and why was that important? Because we are required by federal law to every 30 days fully disclose all of our donors. We can't hide. You write, you write a check to the RNC, in 30 days, your name is going to show up on a list. Yep. You know, your name, your address, your company, the amount you gave, et cetera. Um, and that, that was a level of transparency in the system. McCain-Feingold took away that ability, limited it severely. And, of course, you had, um, you know, Dave Bossi over at Citizens United uh, say, all right, with the, with the commercial that they, that they ran, the anti-Hillary Clinton commercial, that they ran at the time and the money that they raised for that, um, you know, the Supreme Court said, yeah, they can do that. Uh, And so that opened up that door. The problem was in opening that door, you left out of the room the requirement to disclose your donors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think to the extent that we want the the American people, look, I I believe money is property. Mm-hmm. And as such, I can do with it as I am fit to do under our Constitution. And and that means if I want to give Adam's, uh, Adam Kinzinger a million dollars, I can give Adam a million dollars. The only requirement should be that when, and I'm sure Adam would love me to give him a million dollars <laughs> uh, for, for his super PAC or for his campaign. But, the, but you know, the, the current restrictions notwithstanding, the only requirement the, the most important requirement should be that, um, you know, I'm disclosed mm-hmm. as a donor. Some states do that. Within 24 hours, it's made public in the local newspapers, uh, these campaign contributions, et cetera. So I think to the, more, uh, to the extent, Adam, we're able to uh, expose uh, who these donors are, you take the mystery away. Yeah. And, and you and I know that, you're not going to take you're not going to take money from someone who is nefarious or suspicious character or organization. You're not. You're just not. You you don't want the headache. You don't want the scrutiny by the press. So you take the, you 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 avoid it. But if there's a way you can shield that, you, you maybe you're you know you're strapped for cash. You're not going to pay so much attention to that mm-hmm. until at some point in the future it's disclosed, and then you're back in the soup. You could have avoided with full disclosure. 18 months before. Yeah, and that's what's interesting is, you know, if you take that position, and I agree with you on that, uh, I uh, agree 100% actually with with all your analysis of that, but, you know, now in an election, it's like, okay, but you have to fight with the tools you're granted, but then you can be called a right. hypocrite because the thing you're against, you're using, and I think that's what kind of leads to a stalemate where you have bigger and bigger fundraising requirements. I had a friend that ran for Senate and one that had told me, uh, a while ago, he goes, you know, look, I raised 50, 60 million for my campaign. But he goes, somebody can just write a check, start their own pack, you know, put 100 million in and decide that my race is all going to be about abortion when I've been, you know, trying to avoid that subject on the campaign trail. And that was eye opening to me that that, you know, was yeah. the case. Well, that's and that's our political that's our political ra- uh, reality around the money is how do you how do you uh, otherwise uh put in place the accounting processes and all of that, but more importantly, level the playing field so that it is somewhat fair. You cannot create a system um, in which you, um, you know, tie my hand behind my back and then be bad at me if, you know, I choose not to have my hands tied behind my back um, instead Mm -hmm. because my opponent isn't. And, And we saw Obama do that in 2008. Um, you know, he beat the hell out of John McCain, you know, to try to pressure him to take, you know, public financing. And then in the final, at the final <laughs> moment, decide, oh, no, I'm not going to do public right. financing. <laughs> right. Yeah. It was amazing. Right? Because he realized, why should I tie my hand behind my back? Um, because Republicans are a financial juggernaut. Um, and whether or not John McCain is able to, uh, you know, through his campaign raise money, all these other organs that are affiliates of, of the McCain campaign and the Republican Party are, are unfettered to, to raise uh, the cash that they need. So we've got to create the balance in the system. A, a public financing system is ideal, 
but um, I don't know if that that if that ideal becomes reality. So to mm-hmm. your point, let's let's deal with the reality in our polit- in our political system from a, a money management side, and come to a consensus on uh, what kind of elections we want to run, and what do we want to control those elections? Do we want the ability to raise a lot of cash to control? Or do we want someone um, who maybe has some good ideas to get out in front and talk about that? And that's what I liked about what I saw in the Democratic primary in 20 was the Adam, uh, the Adam, the uh, Andrew Yangs and Pete Buttigieg's are, were able to pull together a, a campaign around ideas hmm. first. And then the money came in afterwards. And that 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 was very interesting to watch how that how that developed. Don't know if it's going to last, but it was an interesting development. Yeah, and I think one of the biggest things that's why I've been kind of so active on Twitter calling grifts out is, is just making people aware of what's happening. You know, if you get yeah. this panicked text about I need you to chip in five bucks before this day or, you know, everybody will die, you need to understand that that's, <laughs> that is they don't have any idea what you think, who you are. They just want you to give them money. And it's fine. If you want to do it, that's fine. But you need to be aware of that. So That is so true. That is, they're all like that. I'm laughing. I'm laughing because I literally got a boatload of those today uh, of, you know, you know, if you don't if you don't help me now, you know, we're we're about to the world is going to end. Yep. And I just started laughing. I was like, Yeah, okay. I know where you live. <laughs> Hey, let me, I'm going to, I got one more question for you, but I want to mention, so I don't forget, uh, your Twitter is at Michael Steele and Instagram is at chairman underscore Steele. So give him, give him a follow, but let me, check me out. yeah, check him out check him out. Uh, let me, let me ask you, cause I get asked all the time, you know, why are you still a Republican that kind of stuff? And I say, look, I was a Republican prior to Donald Trump. And by the way, I've been consistent in what I believe the whole time. Let me, so I want to ask you that question. Do you still consider yourself a Republican? Why or why not? I do. Uh, I've actually, now that I, I think about it, I've been a Republican <laughs> longer than you've been alive. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I joined the party at 17 years old, uh, in 1976. Hmm. It was my first presidential ele- election. I was wowed by, um, uh, a candidate running for the presidency who got his clock cleaned in the Republican primary named Ronald Reagan. Oh, I man, that guy. His, uh, yeah, that guy, right? <laughs> I admired his stance um, uh, on a number of issues. And as I tell people, he sounded a lot like my mother <laughs> uh, in how she raised me. And my mother was a Roosevelt Democrat, which makes a lot of sense, given that, you know, um, you know, Reagan was once himself a Roosevelt Democrat. But... <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I've been a Republican now for 40 or 45 years. And it, it, for me, um, I was here, I've been here a long time. I've carried a lot of water for this party. I've taken a lot of crap for it. Um, and I've taken it both inside and outside the party. And I stay because as the analogy that I use is if someone came into my house and started breaking my furniture and writing on my walls and tearing up my floorboards, would I leave or would I kick them out? Right. And so my point is I'm going to stand my ground for as long as I can. I may have to leave someday because, you know, it's just untenable. And, you know, there is no, there is no way that they want me involved. Okay, that's fine. But until that fight is done, uh, I will continue to press on those things that drew me in, which is freedom and individual liberty. So I refer to myself, Adam, as a Lincoln Republican, mm-hmm. um, because I, I really anchor my moorings to the founding of the party, why we came into existence. We came in existence to stand for those who are being enslaved and oppressed. That's we right. came into existence to stand for the liberties of every citizen, everyone on this soil whether they were brought here as a slave or they came here on their own. And that, for me, was the most important part of this, uh, this narrative, was being able to do that uh, and to, um, to, get, to get that message out uh, to the American people uh, through my involvement in the party and, and knowing that my community was largely, a, um, largely found its political home 
uh, in the Republican Party uh, from, the, from its very beginning. It just all made sense, mm-hmm. and it still does to me. Well, that's awesome. I'll tell you, you know, I think what you're saying and what I'm trying to do, you know, we have to have really kind of open warfare for the soul of the Republican Party because, you know, there's a lot of talk of we need to just unify and I'd love to be unified. But when it's unifying under, you know, in essence, Donald Trump, not him particularly, but saying nobody can be outside of whatever his prescription is, that's not unity, that's capitulation. I think you refuse to do that and I do too. Look, I really appreciate having you on here. This has been, uh, you know, I've, I've been watching you for as long as you've been involved. I've gotten to know you, uh, you know, over time, but especially fairly recently. And I admire what you're doing. And uh, you can count, you know, me as a friend. And I uh, really appreciate having you on today, my friend. Well, it's the, it's the same here. I've been watching you since your campaign in 2010. <laughs> uh, I remember well the, the Illinois races that we had. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's just been a real treat and and just a personal uh sense of pride for me to watch you assert your leadership so so firmly and so strongly and so correctly for the country and uh i appreciate that so right back at you um anything i can do to help you in your service uh in congress and to the country count me in We hope you enjoyed our conversation today and our thanks to Michael Steele and Congressman Kinzinger for their time. As we've mentioned before, we're just at the beginning of a series of conversations that Country First will be hosting on the need to put country over party. Don't forget, next week we'll have a chance to speak with Michael Wood, the U.S. congressional candidate out of Texas making waves in the special election that's coming up in the beginning of May. We invite you to visit the website, countryfirst.com. That's with a one S-T in the URL, countryfirst.com. Make sure you subscribe to receive all the latest updates. And all of our podcasts can be found on our YouTube channel as well. And hey, make sure you get a chance to watch and share on your social media channels today as well. My name is Matt Rodewall. Thank you once again for joining us. And we will see you next time as we put country over party.